Hey, good morning, everybody. How about that? Super Bowl Sunday here at Faith Bridge. Uh, those of you who are visiting, welcome to our party. We're so glad you're here. Uh, let me just do a quick survey. Uh, how many of you here uh, are planning this evening? Remember, you're in the house of the Lord. How many of you here are planning to cheer for the Patriots? Let's hear it from you. Represent. Okay. All right. Meager. Uh, okay. How about uh, how many of you are as good Christians are... are uh, going to cheer for, let me put it like this, how many of you are going to mount up with wings like eagles? Let's hear it. Cheering for the eagles. All right. Fantastic. All right. Let's close in prayer. No, uh, no, actually, no, I, you know, some of you were here for the first time this morning and go, what the heck? I mean, what is all the stuff, the balloons, I, you know, and, and, and uh, because you don't really think of a church and a party, you don't really think of those things kind of going together. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I think the comedian Stephen Wright talks about oxymorons, you know, words that, that are next to each other that seem to cancel each other out. And he, you know, gives examples like jumbo shrimp and, and uh, civil war, you know, and country music and, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, Microsoft works. And, and, and so you think of some of these things, well, wait a minute, and a church party, I mean, that does, yeah, what, what is that? Uh, about, but actually, uh, what I want to try to do uh, this morning, and, and the time we have is, is, I want to try to explain to you why we are this place right here, why we are hosting a Super Bowl party, why we have a reason to celebrate, why we, why we really can be joyful, not just on Super Bowl Sunday, whether our team wins or loses, but to, but but throughout the year. And as I was thinking about how do you how do you explain that, especially. If you're, if you're kind of new to the, this thing and you're just kind of here this morning because your friend said, hey, come, they got popcorn, and, uh, and then bring it back to the house for our party. And, and, uh, and you go, I'm not really sure. How, I think I can explain it this morning in terms of three very simple ideas. And, and, and frankly, if you don't remember anything else that I say this morning, if you can remember those three ideas, that's huge. That's huge. Um, the, the, and, and, and I'm going to actually have you do this with me. I think it might uh, help you remember. It's very simple. The first idea that I want you to remember this morning is simply this. God has a plan. God has a plan. In fact, why don't we do this? Why don't we, um, I want you to channel your, your favorite uh, cheerleader, and I want you to give me the hand motion. God has a plan. Let's say it together. Ready? God has a plan. Okay, yeah, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that sounds like a couple hundred uh, people with disinterest. Uh, what I want is a little bit more, uh, I, I need a little bit more volume here. Uh, this is kind of, uh, this is Super Bowl Sunday. It's like, God has a plan. So, so I want this big, big enough so that people who are still out there uh, kind of uh, eating the popcorn, uh, they will hear uh, echoing through the hallway, God has a plan. Okay, so let's do this big. Here we go. Ready, go. God has a plan. Excellent, excellent. Okay, fact number two goes like this. Man has a problem. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's try that one. Everybody ready to go? Man has a oh, Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, let me explain one thing because I see some of you ladies nodding your head. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, our problem is women. No, no, I actually, uh, whoa, okay. I can see it tomorrow's headline, bald preacher mauled by angry women in church. But uh, actually, uh, actually, I, I do need to explain. When I say man has a problem, uh, this is kind of important. We don't actually mean men alone have a problem uh, or, or just uh, men have a problem. Uh, and in fact, I, I guess I hadn't really wanted to explain this, but let me just kind of lay it out there. This, I, I feel embarrassed. But, but when we're done with this, uh, see what the scripture says is God has called all of us to, he's invited all of us to this plan, this, this grand story that is bigger than we could imagine. But all of us have sort of settled for smaller stories. We, we have a plan. And it's not, just, it's not just males. It's every human being, male and female. You say, well, then why don't you just say male and female? And here's why. Because when we're done with this, these three facts, this is going to sound really stupid. When we're done with these, I want this to sound a, it, I want this to sound a little bit like a rap. <laughs> Like, but probably when I walked out on stage and some of you saw me for the first time, you thought to yourself, I'll bet the dude raps. 
And, uh, and, and no, you're laughing, but seriously, you should have seen me at Christmas. Tons of rapping. And, uh, and I do, no, 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 no. You know what? My favorite uh, rapper is Scoop Doggy Poo. But I do, I do, I, I want to sound like a rap, and so it won't work as well if we go, God has a plan, homo sapiens have a problem. So, so we're going to say, man has a problem. Okay, so let me hear that, everybody. Ready? Go. Man has a problem. Okay, let me just say one more thing, because I know you're doing the very best you can. I see that. I can see that. But you seem happy about it. You're going, man has a problem, and I hope the sucker burns. That's not really... That's not really what we're going for here, okay? I want angst. I need, I need to see, can, I, want you to, I want you to imagine that someone has parked a church bus on your feet. Okay, I want that man has a problem. Let me, let me see that, ready, go. Man has a problem. Okay, excellent. All right, so we got two facts so far. Fact number one is what, everybody? God has a problem. Fact number two, Man has a problem. Fact number three is my favorite. It goes like this. God has a plan. Man has a problem. The choice is up to you, sucker. All right, so let's, uh, let's try that uh, together. Just that last line, all right? Just that last line. Here we go. Ready? Go. The choice is up to you. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, some of you totally nailed the sucker part. Uh, uh, no, here's the thing. Now, see, some of you have uh, apparently decided, I'm going to take a pass on the hand motions. And this grieves our Lord. And, and, and so uh, what I want you to do is I, I want to see those hands moving. So, so let's try that one. The choice is up to you. Ready? Go. The choice is up to you. Oh, <laughs> okay. You don't actually have to point at me. Uh, it's a little humiliating. Okay, so I tell you what, this time just point uh, around you at people obnoxiously, uh, perhaps to someone to whom you're married. Uh, and, and so let, let's try it. Here we go. Ready? Go. The choice is up to you, sucker. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think, I think you got to handle this thing. Uh, we're going to do this, all of us together, big. Uh, and, and, and I want it loud. Hand motions, the whole deal. Here we go. Ready? Hit it. God has a plan, man has a problem, the choice is up to you, sucker. Give yourselves a round of applause, you're good, you're good. <laughs> I can see it now. Some of you who are kind of here for the first time this morning, you're gonna go home and somebody's gonna say, well, what did they do at that kind of religious thing? And you're gonna go, God has a plan, man has a problem, the choice is up to you, sucker. And they're gonna say, you're on drugs. But uh, yeah, uh, no, those three facts, those three ideas are huge. Those three ideas literally have shaped and fractured human history. And, and so if, if, if this morning, if you want to understand why do we do what we do on Super Bowl Sunday morning with a party, why do we do this week after week? Why can we celebrate? How can we be joyful? It comes down to these three simple facts. First of all, God has a plan. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When, 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 when uh, I was in high school, middle school, some of you, uh, middle school, high school folks, I, I, didn't, I, I wasn't excited about that. I wasn't excited about God's plan. My, my idea was kind of like, God has a plan, and I hope he keeps it. I mean, to me, God's plan was about the last thing you'd want to get excited about. It was right up there with eating broccoli. Uh, I mean, uh, just no, no, no thank you. Uh, I'm not that interested. Because I thought of God as kind of the... I kind of God's kind of the anti-life. The, he was the anti-party. Uh, that, 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 and I don't know where I got this idea that God somehow was the cosmic hall monitor uh, uh, just, who was just looking for people who might be enjoying life and <laughs> zits, you know, and, and uh, you know, or, 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 and, and I think it started, I'm going to be honest with you, as I think about it, I was reflecting on this, I think it started a little bit when I was a little boy, when I was a little boy, uh, my mom made us go, me and my brother, every summer we had to go to vacation Bible school. Vacation Bible school. And in our church, it wasn't called vacation Bible school. It was called VBS, which sounded like a, a social disease. And, and, and I remember, you know, my mom would say, do you kids want VBS this summer? We're going, no, mom, we'll get shots. And I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of intimidating. And then whenever you went, whenever you went, I don't care what happened. I mean, just maybe it was just my experience, but I don't care what question anybody asked about anything. What does the Bible say about burping? There was always the same answer. This 
person would look at us with this kind of prune face and go, if Jesus were here, would you do it? And I was scared to death. I'm like, a, I'm a little kid, right? I, I still remember the day I'm sitting there, little seersucker shorts. I'm about 43. And uh, no, I, I was probably about five years old. And I remember sitting there and, I, and somebody asked, I don't even remember what the question was, but all of a sudden I asked this question and this bony, hairy finger, is, it looks like a tree limb with Spanish moss. And, and, and she pointed at me and she said, if Jesus were here, would you do it? I, I, was, I, I was constipated for three days. So I'm, <laughs> No way, Jesus is here, I ain't doing it. And, and I, I'm just terrified. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, and then I would go to church and go, nope, these people do look constipated. And, 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 and I think sometimes we have this notion that, 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 that God party, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually think so. It wasn't actually until my freshman year of college that a guy said to me, Duffy, if you want to know God's plan, if you really want to know God's plan, this guy loved me enough to say this. He said, if you really want to know God's plan, if you want to know why there is joy, why God is, is, is not someone from whom we run, you have to look at Jesus. Yeah. He said, you have to look at Jesus because Jesus was God's plan in the flesh. See, he fleshed out God's plan. He, he, he was God's plan in the flesh. In other words, Jesus didn't say, um, I, I can tell you the plan or, or I can point you to the plan or I can teach you something about the plan. Jesus said, I am the plan. I am the plan. I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. I can still remember as a college kid, the first time I heard these words, it was just astonishing. It just kind of, it just kind of, to wrap my brain around it. In John chapter 10, he's, my buddy said, if you want to know God's plan, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, here's God's plan. John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, you might be sitting here this morning and go, well, <laughs> you know what? My life is already pretty darn abundant. Like I got, I mean, I'm driving kids all over the place. I got work. I'm, I, I'm, I've got schoolwork. I got my team. I got a computer tutor. I got dance. And, and, and I mean, you know what? I, if, if you mean if, if I'm more stuff in my life, I don't think so. Here's what's so amazing about Jesus' words. And I hope you hear this. I hope we hear this. You see, when, when Jesus was talking about abundant life, this is what's so radical about his teaching. He wasn't talking about life this way. See, that, that's the way we think of it, isn't it, in our culture, like more money, more stuff, more friends, bigger car. Jesus said, I'm not talking about life that way. I'm talking about life this way. In other words, he understood, as, as all of us do deep down in our gut, that you can have a life that's a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, we think in our culture the goal is to live large. Jesus said, no, the goal is to live deep, to live deeply, to know a richness to your life, a depth to your life, to your relationships, to your friendships, to your marriage, to your hopes, even to your pains. And, and, and this is something that all of us are wired for. Every one of us in this room, in our, in our gut, this is what we long for. This is what we're created for. Even those guys tonight, when they take the field, you know, people will be cheering for them. And they're making millions of dollars. But even those guys on the field, just like us, at the core of their being, what they yearn for, what they hunger for, is fullness of joy, life abundant. God has a plan. God has a plan. But that's where fact number two comes into play. It's very important. God has a plan. What's fact number two? Everybody remember, let's say it together. Fact number two is what? Man has a problem. That's right. Man has a problem. Man has a problem. The, the scripture says that God has invited all of us to this great plan, this, this story to live into who he has invited us to be, to recreate us into who he made us to be. But we have a problem. And the problem is what the Bible calls sin. Now, some of you who are just visiting today are probably going, oh, great, typical church deal. Like, I knew it. Uh, you know, the guy hadn't been speaking 10 minutes, although it seems like quite a bit longer. Uh, he hadn't been speaking 10 minutes, and already, already he's calling us sinners. Knew it was, you know what? When I was in high school, 
I, I would go to church. I didn't even know what a sinner was. I had no clue. Like, I remember, I, I didn't know it was bad. The preacher would point to us up on the balcony. Us kids would go, you kids are sinners. We're kind of going, thanks. <laughs> you know, we do what we can. I mean, we didn't know it was negative. No, I mean, you're laughing. I came home and said, Mom, the preacher said I'm a sinner. She said, you are a sinner. I said, Mom, look at me. I am too short to play sinner. And I, I didn't have a clue what the heck he was talking about. I think, in fact, I'm almost convinced that one of the main reasons some of us, maybe even in this room this morning, aren't more pumped about God's plan because, frankly, we don't really have a sense of the depth of man's problem. You see, this, this problem of sin, this problem of sin is a very, very serious problem. Uh, it, it essentially means that we put ourselves in the center of a universe where only God is the rightful center. In other words, maybe one of the easiest ways to, to understand sin, I remember one of the first ways I began to understand it, it, myself as a new Christian, was I just took the word sin. Somebody said, spell it out, S-I-N, circle the center letter I. Because when I put myself at the center of my life, I make myself God. In other words, in other words, it's, it's not that you don't believe in God. Like you might, you're like, oh my gosh, like I totally believe in God. Oh yeah. Hey, it's not that you don't believe in God. It's that we don't let God be God in our lives. We're going to be God in our lives. I am going to do it my way. And the scripture says, this is not just stuff we do. This is who we are. In Romans chapter three, Paul puts it like this. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, God's, God's plan. It's this problem of, of, of sin. And actually what the scripture says is, in fact, that this problem of sin is so severe and so serious that the, that the end result or, or the, 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 the final chapter of this story or the, or the wages of, of sin is death. It's death. Now, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of times I speak to teenagers. I speak to teenagers a lot. And you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, when, when I talk to them about, about death, they're going, well, Duffy, you know what? I, uh, you know, I, I, know, I understand why you believe in God. You're old. You're going to die soon. Uh, you know, and, and it's not funny. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but you know what? Uh, I'm not really worried about that. And I get that. I understand that. But here's what we need to understand, men and women. And here's what all of us do understand in our core is while the scripture is very, very clear about a separation from God when we die, when we stop breathing. What the scripture also speaks to very clearly and what all of us know very vividly, if we're honest enough to stop and feel it, is that there's a deadness in our lives. There's a deadness in our world. That, that, that things are not the way they're supposed to be. There are injustices, there are racisms, there are hurts, there are uh, terrorist acts, there are bad things that happen and it shouldn't be that way and it does, that the world is broken. Why? Because God has a plan. Man has fallen short of that plan and the end result of that plan is death. Not, not just when we die. But even when we live, death to marriages, death to relationships, death to our hopes, death to our sense of self, death to, to our ability to give life and forgiveness for what we've done, it, death surrounds us. Because God has a plan, man has a problem. <laughs> and now at this point, you might be thinking, well, Duffy, uh, look, I don't, like, I don't want to be rude, dude, you, you, you know, but, but I got to be honest with you, if you're trying to get us in a party mood, it's not working. Like, this is just about the most depressing thing I've ever heard. Can we just close in prayer, go home, and forget the Super Bowl? We'll just watch reruns of Lost. You know, and, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I get that. But that's what makes this third fact so awesome. That's why we have the party. That that's why we celebrate in this building every week on Sunday morning. We gather together because by God's immeasurable love for us, by his grace, by his mercy, he allows us. He's made a way for us to make a choice, to make a choice between God's plan and man's problem, between life abundant and death forever. I remember uh, my junior year of high school, 
I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and me and my buddies, uh, one of the things we love to do on spring weekends uh, was head down to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. A bunch of us would jump in a car, and we'd head down there for the weekend, and we loved it. It was great. Uh, we loved everything about Myrtle Beach. How many of you have ever been to Myrtle Beach? Let me see a show of hands. Yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, it, you, the, we love the, sa- the sand, we love the sun, we love the surf, the, everything. The only, the only thing we didn't like about Myrtle Beach was the name Myrtle Beach. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, you know, I mean, like I was in California a few weeks ago. They have these great beach names out there, right? You know, like, like Redondo, you know, Malibu, Hermosa. You know, I mean, it, it just sounds so romantic. Like sometimes I'll look into my wife's face and I want to say something romantic. I'll go, Hermosa. You know, like I never look at her and go, Myrtle. You know, I mean... Yeah, I mean, and that's why the Beach Boys didn't go, we'll go Bermuda and Myrtle, you know, come and grab your girdle. I mean, it just not, it just not, it don't work. I think they, 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 but you know what? We didn't care because Myrtle Beach was our beach. We love going down there. And when we would go down to Myrtle Beach on these spring weekends, what we would do is we would, we would just immediately uh, go to this uh, big, huge roller coaster. You're going to know what I'm talking about. You've been to this place, I bet. This big, huge roller coaster about 10 blocks south of the main part of town. And it was a vintage roller coaster, right? I mean, this is, this is one of those big, huge machines made totally out of wood and metal, uh, probably three times the highest part of the ceiling here. Uh, just this vintage roller coaster. Every now and you'd see a board just break loose, you know. And, uh, and, 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 and we just, and, and, and the name of it, this is awesome. The name of the roller coaster was the Swamp Fox. Swamp Fox. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're a high school guy, I mean, you, you go, where are you going? Swamp Fox. Dude, get out of his way. I mean, just sound, like when you name a roller coaster, Swamp Fox is right. You don't, like, you don't name a roller coaster, you know, Tinkerbell's Dust Bag. I mean, it's got to be something that has some teeth to it, right? And, and, and we love we loved the Swamp Fox. And me and my buddies, we, over the years, uh, in our high school experience, began to develop these techniques for riding the roller coaster. We all knew, as all of us do, uh, that uh, this is part of, I think, our nature, is that you learn when you get on a roller coaster, you must put your hands in the air, Right? You know, you don't, you don't get on a roller, you have to have your hands up, you don't, and scream, you don't get on the roller coaster and, you know, go, oh, wow, this is splendid. You know, I mean, you got to have your hands up and yelling, and, and, uh, and, and so that's what we did. And so, and so my buddies each had their own distinctive style, like some of them kind of, you know, Quasimodo, and, 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 and some, you know, just like the flying fish, and some the Pentecostal, and, 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 and some uh, too many hot dogs, and, 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 and my style, the Duffy Robbins signature style, I know you're curious, uh, was I would get in the very front car of the Swamp Fox, very front car, and then I would stand up, and then I would lean forward and pretend like I am super duff. I mean, such a buzz to feel the wind blowing through my glasses. I mean, it was just awesome. And, and, and in fact, my wife to this day, she will not ride a roller coaster with me because, she, because she, it, the first time we rode together, interesting, was in Dallas, Texas at the state, I think it was the state fairgrounds. And, and I remember she uh, did not know about Superduff. And we got to the top of the first hill and I stood up. And she goes, I don't think it's over yet. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, you know, next thing you know, we're going to, yeah, 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 you know, right, whoa, come on, woman. And I'm laughing and screaming. She got so scared, she grabbed the back of my pants and started crying. And I'm laughing, woo, yeah, super dog. I look down, my pants are down on my thighs. And I think might be why she was crying. But, but uh, we actually have some video footage, just kidding. But, uh, but she will not, she will not get on a roller coaster with me to this day. Well, anyway, this particular, this particular night, I was on the Swamp Fox. I'd already probably ridden about eight times, right? So I've already done all the compulsory stuff. Now I'm doing some freestyle. Uh, there's a small crowd of people down below looking up at me, pointing, go, he's a fool. 
And, and I am just doing super duff, loving it. And just, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and you're just hearing the shriek of the wheels and screaming people. And, and of course, your G force is pulling your cheeks like that. And saliva is going in your ear. I mean, it's just like, yeah. And, 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 and I, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right about there is when it happened. You know that bar that holds you in? Well, that bar broke. Just popped out like that. And that bothered me. <laughs> because I sensed Super Duff is going to fly. And, 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 and uh, of course, being a male, I have to act like I meant this to happen. And, and, and so part of me goes, no, you, you know, you're not going to sit down, dude. You, your friends are you're watching. They're going to think you're a lily. You will not sit down. You will remain standing, hands aloft, screaming, and you will go out in a blaze of glory. And then this still small voice in my head said, that's going to hurt. And, and, and so I quickly put my hands down. We finally coast to the end of the ride, get out. Me and my buddies go back to the hotel. I put on some dry pants. And, 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 and they were laughing. And I said, what's so funny? They said, you don't know. I said, no, I do not. I had a near-death experience tonight. More raucous laughter. And I said, I don't get it. They said, Duffy, you don't know what's funny? I said, no, please, what is it? He said, Duffy, remember what you used to always say to us? I said, what? They said, you used to always brag to us that the Swamp Fox would be a great ride if they'd get rid of that stupid bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know we'd be moving when they got rid of it. I mean, but that was true, right? Because I would kind of brag to my buddy. He said, you know what? I'm super duff. Like, I'm super duff. I don't need this bar. This bar is holding me down. This thing is cramping my style. You only go around once in life. I know that's in the Bible someplace. And, 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 and I want to grab for all the gusto I can. And, and I want to go hands up, maximum ride. And this bar is getting in the way. And I would even try to trick the guy. You know the guy that runs the thing? He's like cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve, 43 tattoos on his arm, who does the lever. And, and, and I would try to fool him because he would always come by and check everybody's bar. And I'd put my knees up here slam it down, and, and you come back, another ride, I'm, oh, you don't understand, I'm super tough, regulation, buddy, <laughs> slam this thing down, and I just said to my friends, I just wish they'd get rid of that stupid bar. They did. And that was the night I discovered something I'd never really understood before. That bar was not holding me down. It was holding me in. That is precisely the discovery I made at Thanksgiving weekend, my freshman year of college, at this dumpy little retreat center near Greenville, South Carolina, when one of my buddies there at UNC Charlotte said, Duffy, dude, you're my best friend. I love you. I love the fun and adventures we have together. But he loved me enough to say this as well. He said, you know what? You're scared. It hurts me to say it. It hurts me to see it, but you're scared. When you walk into a situation, I see it. You're always kind of wondering, who am I going to be to make them like me? Or how am I going to feel about this? I got to see how they feel about it. You're scared about what's going to happen. You're scared about this. You, 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 you are a guy who is going on this roller coaster of life, and you're scared to death. And then he said this. I've never had anybody actually say this in terms I understood. But I can still remember he said, you're never going to know freedom, real freedom. You're never going to be able to live joyfully unless you put Jesus at the center of your life. And that weekend, that weekend, I didn't understand everything. I didn't have all the answers, but I understood God has a plan. I got a problem. And he's given me this choice. And what I discovered was that by inviting Jesus into my heart, into my life, at the center, right there at the core. With him as my Lord, I discovered a whole new freedom, a whole new freedom to live life abundantly, to live life to the full. You go, but Duffy, that, that's, that's great for you and everything, but I thought you said that the penalty of sin is death. How could you know life when you deserve death? 
And that's what makes the party such a celebration. You see, God sent his son Jesus, who knew no sin, who knew no sin, who did not deserve to die. God sent his son Jesus to die in our place. And when he died in our place on the cross, he paid the debt of death that we owe for our sin. And then, and then, to keep the party going, he rose again from the dead so that we could share with him a whole new life. See, but that, that's not fair. That doesn't make sense. If he doesn't deserve to die, and we do, how can that be just? It's not just. It's totally not just. That's why they call it grace. It's mercy. And what an amazing, wonderful thing that God gives us that opportunity to make that choice. To make that choice. Maybe you're here this morning for the first time. Maybe you've been coming here for a while, but, but you're still kind of working this out. You're just beginning to get it. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today to think about the fact that this God invites you to know life and that we have a problem of sin that money's not going to wipe away. Good wishes are not going to wipe away. You don't get it by, by you know, listening to Oprah more or reading some new age guru and going to a closet and smoke oatmeal. He's, if you want to know victory over the death, it's through the risen Jesus inviting him into our hearts. God has a plan. Man has a problem. By his grace and mercy, the choice is up to us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for these people who've uh, joined us today, and thank you for so much for the family that meets here on a regular basis as a part of Faith Bridge. We, we do want to recognize that you are the source of our joy. And I pray that if someone is here today, and this is kind of a new thing for them, that uh, you would give them the courage to say, you know what, I I got a lot of questions still, but I think I'm understanding some stuff. Maybe to go out to the uh, party on the patio, the tent, and talk to someone there. Or maybe, maybe to say, you know, I'm going to come back next week when Pastor Ken uh, begins to talk more about what it means to live joyfully. But I I'm going to take some next steps so that I can begin to make this choice real in my life that you have died to make open to me. Lord, you're so good, so gracious. We thank you for being with us in this time. We ask all of this in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen.